This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Scattered across this nation, there are places abandoned, boarded up, mysterious. I will unlock their doors and make them yield their secrets. From an extraordinary hospital that pioneered the idea of free medical care for people living on the fringe of society. At a time when the public were paying to gawp at disabled people, the London hospital offered him sanctuary. In a world filled with danger. One of the things that's so chilling about the Ripper is that he dissected his victims, went looking for organs. Who was this man? to a remarkable 400-year-old prison that can reveal the story of British crime and punishment. If these stones could speak, I wonder what stories they'd tell me about the men, women, and children who eked out their sentences in cramped cells. Murder. I killed my mate. To top-secret military facilities hidden away on our coast. I've arrived in the spookiest place with a random collection of buildings, a lighthouse, what appears to be a windmill, roofless bunkers, pagodas, where weapons of mass destruction were tested. Radioactive materials in ponds under liquid. That is unbelievable. This will be my hidden history of Britain. In this program, I'm prizing open the doors to a top secret spy facility. The Russians could get you into a very compromising position. You could be seduced and blackmailed. I was never that lucky. And what kind of size was this thing? Huge, I mean, it covered over 300 acres. And a labyrinth of mysterious military laboratories. A roof that is not a roof. I think these must have been enormous doors. What went on here? Because I was Secretary of State for Defence, I know a few secrets, and I know why you cannot be told them. But if you found out what is done to defend you, would you feel safer? On the Suffolk coast, Orford is exactly what you'd expect an English village to be. Quiet, comfortable, safe. But this hamlet, home to just over 1,800 people, lies only a mile from the location of some of the most top-secret government projects in this country's history. Orford in Suffolk is pretty and tranquil, but it looks out upon some of the weirdest buildings that I have ever seen. I'm going to take a two-minute ferry ride across this narrow stretch of water, but it is an ocean that separates Orford from a world of secrets. Hello, John. Hello, Michael. Mind the steps and step on this seat. Thank you very much. OK. I know very little about the place I'm going to because it's the perfect location for keeping secrets. A bleak, windswept spit of land, nine miles long, one mile wide. Orford Ness is Britain's own Area 51. A century ago, it was bought by the War Office and used for their most classified projects, inventing and testing experimental military technology. By the time I was in the Ministry of Defence, it had been shut down. But legends about the work done here by some of the most brilliant brains in Britain survived. And today, the abandoned locations for that work stand empty and mysterious. I've arrived in the spookiest place with a random collection of buildings, a lighthouse, what appears to be a windmill, roofless bunkers, pagodas, as though a giant had rummaged in a, an enormous toy box and distributed arbitrary pieces. I'm going to begin with this extraordinary tin box, codename Cobra Mist. The name could be straight out of a spy thriller. Maybe because this top secret installation was built and funded by the United States government. 
Well, here's an extraordinary building. It's set on stilts. I guess that makes it harder to penetrate with a tunnel. And it has not a single window. You couldn't exactly describe it as a welcoming building. If walls could speak, this building's message would be loud and clear. Keep out. So what is this bizarre structure trying to hide? The whole thing reeks of the 60s and 70s. Very serious doors. Someone didn't want unauthorised people coming in. Wow. A vast windowless space. Absolutely enormous. This appears to be a floor plan. Radio Corporation of America, Defense Electronic Products, Moorestown, New Jersey, 1967. This was the concept, this was the original draft. Operations and display room. Operations reporting room. Classified documents processing. The presence of classified documents suggests that something big was going on here. What was the US military doing in this strange building on the Suffolk coast? To find out, I'm going to speak to someone who was on the inside. My very own deep throat. It was described as an experimental radio establishment, a testing place. It was top secret. In 1971, Roger Darlington was a young lad from Lancashire, fresh out of college. His skills as a radio technician would thrust him into a world of secrets and spies. There were people with big dogs and big guns walking around in patrols. It was very, very secure. Roger, how young were you when you came here? 22-ish. Oh. <laughs> With a hot piece of paper in my hand saying that I was intelligent, which I wasn't. It was my first job. What was your impression on the first day? Very awe-inspiring, and I think it was very intimidating because of the people that you associated with, both the Americans and the English. So this is you on the wall, is it? <laughs> yes. Longish head, which was unusual for here. Uh, being a civilian, I suppose you were the oddball, not having the hair cut right down to the uh, top, you know. You had to be secretive on what you did, what you said, who you talked to, you were pressurised to be careful. Obviously, when you were away from the base, the natural question would be, what do you do? The answer that everybody was told to give was that the base was an experimental radio base. What I told everybody was that I swept up here, it was the easiest way. Everything about this building screams high security. And it's no wonder. After the Second World War, Russia and the United States were locked in a potentially apocalyptic conflict. These two superpowers vied for supremacy, using Europe as their chessboard. As the world teetered on the brink of World War III, tensions and paranoia ran high. This is the second floor that we're coming up to. Huh. One conference room. What happened in here? This whole building was very cautious about security. One of the things that they did in here was show you films, basically how Natasha could get you into a very compromising position or situation. 
the higher ups felt that the Russians or the like would be wanting to infiltrate this building. And you could be seduced and blackmailed? I was never that lucky. <laughs> Potentially, <laughs> I meant. <laughs> um, yes. One thing that surprised me about this room, it's got uh, windows, because I thought the building didn't have any. Well, it's got curtains. <laughs> mm. Are there no windows anywhere? No, it's basically one huge metal cube. The building? The building itself. It's a metal box to stop any interference, radio interference. What Roger tells me about this building shows that US intelligence was obsessed with keeping whatever work went on here under wraps. Abandoned files. So to understand more, I'm going to dig deeper. Mechanical and electrical services awful mess. <laughs> oh ho, look at that. Antenna focal point. This operation was far bigger than I could have imagined. That is unbelievable. This was one of the most top secret sites in Britain. In the late 1960s, this mysterious building was home to a highly classified US government operation. I'm determined to unlock its murky secrets. Facilities Design Criteria, Department of the Air Force. So this is the um, specification. Map of Suffolk. And here's the site. <laughs> oh ho, look at that. Antenna focal point. So this fan shape, I think, must be a series of antennae and that little blob I'm guessing is the building that I'm in now which is huge and if that's the case this aerial thing was absolutely enormous a gigantic system of aerials half a mile wide once existed behind this building that is unbelievable I can only assume that an installation like this was used for spying. And in the late 1960s, that must have meant keeping tabs on the Russians. Kobermest is, is a remarkable place. When you look at it, you just sense the need to actually provide part of the surveillance system which kept the West safe. Former Naval Submarine Commander Mike Finney spent years interpreting classified radio signals. Well, I served in submarines and I also served in nuclear missile deterrent submarine. So, had a bit of a feel for the, the way that Cold War operations ran. Mike takes me out to the site of the antennae field, or array, to get an idea of its scale. So where are we now in relation to where the array was? Well, we're actually be driving down one side of it. And, and what kind of size was this thing? Huge. I mean, it covered over 300 acres. And so the building which we've been in, which is pretty vast, was actually dwarfed by this entire thing. Oh, yes. It was like a garden shed compared to the, the size <laughs> of the array. It cost a pretty penny or cent, I imagine? Well, I think that the, um, the, the, the consensus is it was about a billion US dollars in today's money just to build it. You can see very clearly the anchoring points for the ends of each strand. So this was the focal point of all those antennae, was it? This is where all the strings of the arrays came into, as you say, the focal point. And these concrete ramps or, or, or pads they're in the formation of the 18 pieces. That's right. They're radiating away like spokes on a bicycle wheel. So on these pads at the front here, you'd have seen the 40-foot the high mast at the front of the array, 
going all the way back 1,800 foot to 180 foot mast at the back end of the array. If you look down here, Michael, you can see the actual line of one of the arrays. So it went down there between those bushes and you see the castle in the background, in yes. fact. Photographs of Cobra Mist's aerial system are not surprisingly very rare. But this footage of its Soviet equivalent gives a good idea of what an awesome sight it must have been. Antennae that big will have collected vast amounts of data. What did they do with all that information inside Cobra Mist HQ? Huh. A massive, well-sealed airlock. Lots of warning signs. Nothing ventured. Nothing gained. So I'm thinking this large room had some sort of activity going on in it. And then separately here, another group of people could come and observe what was going on behind this barrier of glass. Mike Finney has first-hand experience of these Dr. Strangelove-like classified surveillance operations. Mike, it feels like we've penetrated the secret heart of this building. W what happened in here? This is the operation center. This is what Kubermiss was all about. It was actually producing the radar picture which could be interpreted in this very room. So the huge array out there, transmitting, receiving, processing going on throughout the building. I remember the 1970s, so there was no small computers, they're all big computers, and not very much processing power. Ultimately, to produce a picture which would be on consoles stretching down this end. And on this wall was actually a, a big Perspex map, which showed the targets and where they were actually going to aim the radar to monitor activity. What was the point of this? The primary aim would have been detection of missile launch, because the Soviets were operating missiles, testing them and so on. So even though they weren't coming towards us, they would detect them being launched. And it was that ability to detect a missile being launched and in flight that actually gave NATO its early warning capability. The idea was all about buying time to be able to react. Mike reveals that Cobra Mist was part of the arms race as surely as the build-up of missiles and bombs. The Americans tried to spend their way to military superiority. But an enormous American spy station on the Suffolk coast could not be kept under wraps forever. He was known as the Lone Wolf of Fleet Street. That was his nickname. Michael Chapman Pincher is the son of the famous investigative journalist Henry Chapman Pincher. In May 1971, my father got wind of a story that down at Orford Ness, a project was going on which wasn't what it appeared to be. So he comes down to nose around. Does he discover anything, do you think? Well, he approached people at the gate and didn't get past it because in those days, the Official Secrets Act was pretty much um, a blanket which everyone held around them and was pretty impenetrable. You couldn't even reveal the colour of the lino in a ministry. So your father, when he's after a story, how does he go for it? Well, his sources are quite interesting. I have a photograph here which shows him looking supremely confident mm. in front of American generals, British uh, RAF officers, and a series of diplomats and other civil servants. So he was in this charm circle of people who knew what was going on. And because he specialized in defense, a lot of senior officials told him things or pushed him in the direction of things which they thought there were stories that needed to be told. So having been stonewalled at the gates of Cobra Mist, was he able nonetheless to break the story? He wrote an article in the Express in 1971 which reveals the CIA in Britain row. 
a huge radio communications establishment built with American money at Orford Ness on the Suffolk coast is being probed by left-wing Labour MPs. They suspect it is really a giant outstation of the US intelligence service, and they fear that the base might now give Russia another possible target in Britain. So he's on to the story here. Yeah. If the Americans had a listening post in Britain, which was top secret and no one was admitting that it was there, it would make us vulnerable to a preemptive strike by the Russians. Make Britain vulnerable. Make Britain vulnerable. A project as vast as Cobra Mist could scarcely escape the inquisitive attention of Michael's father, Chapman Pincher. His expose riled the secret community and rocked the transatlantic boat. Within two years of its cover being blown, Cobra Mist was shut up and abandoned, its secret work apparently over for good. So was the whole thing a billion-dollar mistake? This enormous building built like a battleship, this array that was outside, nearly half a mile long, mm -hmm. and it only operates for a very limited period of time and then is shut down. The most enormous waste of money, wasn't it? There were noise problems on the system itself, but it did work. And what is noise? Interference of various kinds. It could be radio interference, it could be jamming. It could be, it could be countermeasures, sabotage. Russia had a very, very similar uh, system running, and if they could do jamming on a system like this, they would do. Was it quite a shock to you when you heard it was closing? <laughs> it was, am I working Monday? Oh, eh, what? It's, it's closing. It was that sort, it was very, very abrupt. You got all, it was a week, something like that. All of a sudden your job's gone. It must have been extraordinary for the 22-year-old Roger to enter this bizarre world of espionage. And I wish I'd seen it as he describes it, not just this enormous building, but also the array of antennae stretching half a mile, an enormous investment. And yet one day he's told not to come back to work on Monday. The place closes as mysteriously as it had opened. Why? It seems that Cobra Mist has not yet yielded all its secrets. This is Britain's own Area 51, a highly classified military testing site for most of the 20th century. The mysterious decaying structures of Orford Ness hint at an untold story of government secrets. Well, we're certainly in a remote place, and this is a robustly built building, in fact, with masses of earth on either side of it. Looks like someone was afraid of uh, explosions. Some of our country's finest scientists have worked here on cutting-edge military research. But the work that they did in the 1930s sounds more like science fiction to me. Governments uh, around the world were racing to, to perfect some kind of weapon that could protect civilian populations. Historian David Clark has studied the search for the ultimate superweapon, led by brilliant scientist Robert Watson Watt. He was the person who was basically tasked by the British government to go away and produce some kind of um, secret weapon that could be used against the, uh, the Germans in the war that everyone knew was forthcoming at that time. They were working on a project to actually perfect what was known as a death ray. A death ray being what? A death ray being as some kind of directed particle beam weapon that could be used to bring down enemy aircraft. And at the time the experiments were going on here, people would have been watching uh, Flash Gordon, where the, where the hero was pitted against Ming the Merciless, who had his own death ray. And people thought that this would be how wars would be fought in future. In fact, even the War Office offered a cash reward of £1,000 
to anyone who could demonstrate a death ray that could kill a sheep within 100 yards. But they didn't actually manage to kill their sheep at 100 paces? No, none of these inventions could be demonstrated in the field. So what came of all that work? His technicians said, well, we have noticed that when we're sending out radio beams, that if there's an aircraft in the area, we're getting a strong response. So maybe if we can't produce a death ray, we might be able to get an early warning system that would tell us when enemy aircraft are approaching. So weirdly, out of this fantasy about having a death ray, emerged another secret weapon, which was radar. And, and did that give us a, a serious advantage? Well, it played a major part in us winning the Battle of Britain, in that uh, we had advanced warning of approach of German bombers, so we, we could direct fighters to the places where they needed to be to intercept the Luftwaffe. So here's a thought, that while Britain notoriously underinvested in rearmament in the 1930s, a bit of work was going on right here into a fairly far-fetched thing, a death ray, which accidentally produced radar, which was essential to our survival at the Battle of Britain, which was vital to saving civilization. What were the chances? Secret weapons research is an easy sell when the country's at war. But can you justify keeping the public in the dark once the war is over? Classified military experiments continued at Orford Ness, and the mysterious and frankly weird remains of the buildings where they took place are intriguing. There's evidence of wiring and fuse boxes. The walls and the ceiling are covered in tiles, which turn out to be ceramic. So it's all quite carefully designed. What on earth could have caused this much destruction? These buildings were built in the 1950s and 1960s by the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment, the organization in charge of Britain's nuclear weapons program. But I've no idea what they were for. Some sort of pit and a barrel ceiling. What went on here? And I think these must have been enormous doors. Got a foot thick, made of multi layers. Again, I'm thinking someone was afraid of explosions. This would be blast proof, I should think. What happened here is still covered by the Official Secrets Act. So working out what went on isn't easy. As an archeologist, I find Orford Ness a f absolutely fascinating place. Being a top secret site, things are deliberately made difficult to interpret. Often I could be dealing with a site which is hundreds of years old and I'll know more about it than this site. Angus Wainwright has gone over these buildings with a fine tooth comb, trying to unravel their secrets. We had real trouble with these buildings because when they were dismantled, that was done in a deliberate way so you couldn't interpret what was going on. Really the key to understanding this kind of thing is the people who've worked here. The trouble is that on a site like this, which is very secret, if you didn't work in this particular building, you would know nothing about it. So a vital part of the security was that everyone worked in a silo and, and didn't have an overall view of what was going on here. Exactly, need to know. So even now you're telling me that you don't understand everything about what went on in this building? We don't know the details of what went on, but this one has a few clues in it because you can see insulation everywhere. This was the laboratory where they were heating up or cooling down bombs. Uh, and what sort and size of bomb are we talking about? Well, this building was designed to test a Blue Danube bomb, which was our first atomic bomb. 
This colossal atom bomb, built in 1953, was as powerful as the one that destroyed Hiroshima. It's unnerving to think that in a room like this, enormous atom bombs were heated and cooled to extremes, all so that when the day came for them to be dropped on Kiev or Moscow or Leningrad, they'd go off faultlessly. I'm astonished that military scientists were doing tests on weapons of mass destruction just a hundred miles from London. These mysterious ruins are suddenly looking rather more sinister than they did before. A huge empty chamber with massive walls and a very flimsy roof which again makes me think that someone was afraid that this lot might just go bang. The only way that I can really understand what went on in this world of official secrets is to meet another insider. I was called to a secret meeting and I was told that uh, they wanted me to be a leader in the design and the ballistics of our atom bomb, which was called Blue Danube. 95-year-old Professor John Allen was one of the cleverest scientists of his generation. In 1957, he came here to test the bomb that would carry Britain's first nuclear warhead. You have to put a casing around it. You have to carry it in aircraft. You have to make sure it doesn't go bang over England. So you were involved in dropping bombs yes. just off Alford Ness into the sea? Our bombs, which we dropped over Orford Ness, were uh, dummies. They had the right shape, the right size, uh, all the right equipment. And Orford Ness's job was to track not only the flight of the bomb itself, but how it left the aircraft. And that was a terrible thing to get right. Yeah, I mean, this is all uh, an eye-opener to me. I mean, the layman thinks you open the bomb door and the bomb goes and it doesn't really matter how it goes but you're saying this is all absolutely essential yes that's right you don't get Nobel prizes for this but it has to be done were there any mishaps yes uh, there was one whose hook had failed as it approached over one of the local villages and the bomb fell out got through the bomb doors and landed in somebody's back garden a, d a dummy bomb, but nonetheless a very big object. Not a thing you would welcome, <laughs> and I'm not sure whether their insurance would have covered that. What are your memories of coming here to Orford Ness? Well, how would you describe the atmosphere? It was a very fine collaborative spirit, and you work together, you have scientists, you have engineers, you have uh, you know, oddballs. <laughs> You felt rather proud of it, I think, because it was something ever so special. When you look back, what role did Orford Ness play in developing the British nuclear deterrent? Well, it was, uh, it was quite vital. We realised we were pioneering the dangerous beasters, but although as some people call these weapons of mass destruction, I've only always seen them as deterrents. What a privilege to talk to Professor John Allen. He was here at the time. He makes the history live, his recollections of the team at Orford Ness with their spirit and their enthusiasm. If these buildings are the cathedrals of the British Atomic Weapons Research Program, he is the living witness. Now I know that scientists were testing weapons of mass destruction at Orford Ness, I can understand why such a thick veil of secrecy surrounds it. This building is nicknamed the Pagoda. It looks like the last scene of a James Bond movie. Radioactive materials in ponds under, under liquid keep it cool. I don't know whether this was a pond of some kind. 
a roof that is not a roof. That is to say, a roof that keeps out the rain, but what? Allows everything else to go out, doesn't it? It allows vapors to go out, but you wouldn't allow radioactive vapors to go out. I'm a bit puzzled by that. As Defence Secretary, I argued that nuclear weapons are vital to keep our country safe. But I didn't spend much time thinking about what the boffins were doing hidden away in places like this. Telephone instrument room. I assume that means that when the light is flashing, you, uh, you have to make a phone call to the instrument room, which I suppose is the safe distance from here and probably somewhere you'd much rather be. By the 1960s, it wasn't enough to have atomic bombs that could flatten cities. In the race to stay one step ahead of our enemies, how far would the scientists of Orford Ness go? In these strange, derelict buildings just 100 miles from London, some of the most classified military experiments in our history took place. And something slotted in here. By the 1960s, Orford Ness scientists were working on a weapon, a liquid, that was even more destructive than the atom bomb. It's hard to imagine that anything so destructive as, as, a, as a hydrogen bomb. In 1963, Les Barton was an 18-year-old laboratory assistant in Ipswich. He answered an ad in the local paper for a job at Orford Ness. At the time, to talk about the work he did, testing hydrogen bombs would have been treason. We had to sort of subject the, the nuclear weapons to the kind of stress and beyond that they would, they would feel in action. The new H-bombs were 1,000 times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Japan in the Second World War. I want to know just how risky these tests were. Here's a callow youth for you. It was taken <laughs> just after I'd been interviewed for a job here. You're 18. Yeah. In those days, you haven't even reached the age of majority. You pitch up here on the first day. What's that like? Can you recall it? Scary at first, obviously. Um, surrounded by uh, lab equipment I've never even heard of before. But Im imagine back then when everything was pristine. Yes. And the labs here were spotless, so the whole place was just sparkling. You're working on the hydrogen, hydrogen bomb. bomb yeah. What were you subjecting them to? Well, in order to make it rugged enough to actually get to where it was supposed to do and not blow up in the meantime, the weapon would undergo the most extreme stress. The tests were vibration, uh, thermal shock, centrifuge, these weapons had high explosive in them? They were not armed. They had everything else. Fish fissionable material was there. It would have made a bang, but it would be conventional explosives. But judging by the buildings, they thought it was going to be quite a bang if it went wrong. Well, if a serious bang ever did occur, the support columns were designed to go away. And the big lump on top, the pagoda bit, is intended to plummet into here to contain whatever was happening to this actual structure. Any mishaps? The most dramatic was the hard target area at the other end of the uh, site, the big lump of concrete near Lab 1, where the weapons were actually fired against what's called a hard target to see whether they would survive the impact. They would bounce off the hard target and be caught by nets. That didn't happen one day. They actually missed, missed the nets and on top of that, the jet charge was still going, so the missile was bouncing along towards the shore, which caused major dysentery, as you can imagine, across the, across the whole place. And you're talking about a, a, a missile that was containing explosives? Would have been a bang, yeah. <laughs> I love your euphemism. You always say it would have been a bang. we are talking about quite a big explosion. Um, yeah, it was serious stuff. I mean, I'm not sure it's here anymore, but outside every, the entrance of every lab, there was a blast-proof wall facing outwards where each person who went into the lab had to put our sight badges on. You weren't allowed in here with your own sight badge on. And the reason for that is if something did go bang, somebody with binoculars over there somewhere could see who didn't make it. Yes. It's a sobering thought. What could justify such risky work? There were people out there who wanted to kill us. Anybody who's seen footage of Khrushchev of the United Nations declaring death and destruction on all of the West 
We will bury you, he yeah. said. Mm -hmm. And he meant it. The atmosphere was, there's an enemy and they're out to get us. So the, the attitude here, I think, was that what we're doing is very important. It was not, an, not a distasteful thing to work on an atom bomb. I imagine that many young people now would find it hard to believe that the teenager Les came to work on hydrogen bombs enthusiastically. But what I get from talking to him is that he and many other people believed that our survival depended on our readiness to unleash Armageddon. For almost a century, stretching right back to the First World War, military boffins battered this small spit of land with their secret experimental weapons. So when the work came to an end in the 1970s, the site was littered with unexploded ordnance. That's bombs to you and me. It was a dangerous legacy that had to be dealt with. There are times where you think, well, should I really be doing this? But someone's got to do it. If you get it wrong, yeah, you get it wrong. You only do it once. Rob Green was a bomb disposal officer whose unit was posted here in 1978 to clear the site. Is there still ordnance that could come up here today? Quite easily, yeah. The, the, the island is continually turning, the shingle is turning, and the, there's ordnance out there somewhere, and it's waiting to come up. We can, we, can, we can walk down there and we can find anything. What was the method? Were you, were you doing this systematically, methodically, or were you responding to things as they turned up? We basically pick a 100 meter square. So say you have an area and you put a marker down and you walked 100 meters with a locator, met locator, you found a reading, you then clear, dig down and clear it. How are you beat digging that hole? 99% of the time with a spade. Yes. If we get a big deep reading, we had um, bulldozers and um, uh, little diggers. How dangerous is it as you're digging down towards the bomb? Well, if you've got a bomb that's broken open yes. and you hit it, there's a reasonable chance it'll go off. Pretty dangerous. Yeah, pretty dangerous. And in your time here, how many bombs did you encounter? Oh, the First World War bombs, there must have been a, a good 80, 100 bombs. During the time here, Allied weapons, you know, big bombs, thousand pounders, we must have been a dozen, if not kind of 20 odd. Did you lose anybody in the process? There have been friends that I've known have, that have died in the process of doing EOD, yes. Yes. And, and that's part of the job, that you, you, you live it with the possibility of death? Well, yes, it is. It is without a shadow of a doubt, but it's, you know, it's a job and you've got to get on with it. Rob makes very light of the work that he did, but it's clear that he was in fact in constant mortal danger, digging for bombs, especially those that have been rotting in the shingle for more than a century since they were dropped there during the First World War, which reveals that this sliver of Suffolk has been vital to our war fighting research for more than a hundred years. But the work at Orford Ness was always kept away from the prying eyes of the public. You were pressurised to be careful. In my time here, I've uncovered astonishing stories of scientists pushing the boundaries. It was not a distasteful thing to work on an atom bomb. Barely a mile from the nearest sleepy English village. You don't get Nobel Prizes for this, but it has to be done. Orford seems a thousand miles from Orford Ness, which could be a museum to military technology. I've discovered that from Cobra Mist, the Americans could peer deep into the Soviet Union. Whilst in these quirky pagodas behind me, hydrogen bombs were stress tested to prove their cataclysmic reliability. The people who staffed these enormous investments in espionage and obliteration worked in the hope that village England could be left in peace to lead its tranquil life. In the next programme, I'll unlock a 400-year-old prison to uncover the story of British crime and punishment. The Cray twins came here as a couple of young, tough tearaways. 
they left here as fully accomplished gangsters. Of villains and victims. A black GI was brought to these rooms under sentence of death. And a life spent behind bars. Murder. I killed my mate.